Uh, what a wonderful time of worshiping our Lord together. You know, it, it's great to be able to <clears throat> come together as the church and uh, worship together and study His Word together. Uh, you know, we have, I don't know re- what represented here, for, represented from different states. Uh, our residency is in Florida. We live in Ecuador. Uh, it's hard to figure out where we're from. Uh, but I look forward to the one day worshiping the God of all creation uh, with people from every tribe and tongue and nation. My mom passed away a few years ago and is in heaven now, and we look forward to one day, I look forward to one day standing next to her and hearing that alto once again and joining the choir before our Lord and singing songs like this and, and a new song that we don't know, singing things like Worthy is the Lamb. So this is choir practice, and uh, we're preparing for that day. But it's, it's God's church, it's God's people that is preparing for that day. Um, the theme that I want to look at this morning uh, is to be transformed and mobilized. Transformed and mobilized. God ordained uh, three different institutions, and if I was to ask you, I'm sure that you could figure out what these, what these are. Uh, but it begins with family. And then we see, as we work through Genesis, we see government established, and eventually the church. And those three institutions uh, can be at odds with one another these days. Uh, We often rebel against those as an institution, but God gave those to us. Uh, If you were to talk with Rex uh, after after this weekend, you'll hear that I have my opinions on government. (laughs) Uh, both in the United States and in Ecuador or Nicaragua. Uh, but you know, those things are, are passing. Uh, God, I, in the end, I re- recognize that God sets up and takes down those who are, are in authority. But the institution of family was the first that God instituted with Adam and Eve, right? And then later, the church. And so those are the things that, I, that we need to spend our time focused on, and that's what I want to focus on this morning, is, is life, life with the family and the church. Though these two things are both my passion, and uh, if you get to spend more time uh, with me, you'll hear me talk about those things pretty frequently. Charles Spurgeon said that the church is the world's hope. As Christ is the hope of the church, so the church is the hope of the world. You know, we often say, well, well, Christ is the hope in this world, and that's absolutely true. But he does that through his church, right? Remember I mentioned right before we sang Matthew 16, verse 18, that he said, I will build my church? That was the platform in which he would present himself to the world in this age. That's you and I, as part of the body, we are the hope of the world. So we believe that the church must be at the center of each stage of this process, and any attempts to bypass the church is, a, is, is the, only the process or the attempt to bypass the only institution that God ordained and said that it would defeat the very gates of hell. The church is important. The church is the only thing that God has ordained in this age for it to, as his platform to reach the world. Christopher Wright said God's mission of redemption has a church. The church was made for the mission of God. There's a purpose. That's what we we need to recognize, is that there is a purpose. Many people uh, recognize that they have a new position before Christ, and they just are simply content with their new position, that they are a new creature, and and we have received salvation by by God's grace. And we're content, content with our new position, and many believers do not ever come to the realization or recognition of a new purpose. It's not only a new position, but a new purpose. And each believer needs to be mobilized into their new purpose. We are a new creation. The old has passed and the new has come, says 1 Corinthians. So what does it mean to be transformed and mobilized? That's what we want to look at this morning, to be transformed and mobilized by the gospel. That's what we want to look at. So if you have your Bibles with you, we're going to go to the book of Acts in chapter 18. And we're going to look at a couple 
a couple that is uh, the most frequently mentioned in the New Testament, that more, than, more than any other couple. Acts chapter 18 and verses 1 through 3. We want to see how one lives on mission in the gospel. That's my first point, one, how one lives on mission in the gospel. Let's start with Acts chapter 18, and I'll begin reading it in verse 1. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. Now let's skip down to verse 11. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. We see here in just these few verses of Paul mobilized uh, or, or live, living uh, on mission in the gospel, living on mission in the gospel. So Paul arrives in Corinth, this is uh, in his second missionary journey, and he finds this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, they are Latin names, and uh, they arrived in Corinth because they were driven out by Claudius, as we read in the text here, right? Uh, there's some debate as to whether they were believers before they met Paul, or perhaps Paul even led them to Christ. Uh, but at the least, we see in, the, in, these, in this chapter here that they are new believers. We don't know exactly when they came to Christ. At any rate, we see that tent making is their trade. And uh, this is the thing that brought Paul and this couple together, the, the common bond that connected them at first, anyway. This, it was the trade of tent making. So what is this all about? You, you, you would kind of read this and like, oh, because they, they made tents and they met this couple, they were refugees. You know, what is the point of all of this? Well, we see here Paul, Paul showing us and demonstrating to Aquila and Priscilla what it means to live on mission in the gospel. To live on mission in the gospel. I mentioned in, in the previous hour uh, the Great Commission, which is found in Matthew, one of the passages found in Matthew 28. That's the kind of the, the, the classic Great Commission text. And we see, as you are going, make disciples. Literally, as you are going, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. So this is literally as you are going. So in other words, whatever you are doing, whatever it is, years ago when we first arrived at, at a church in western New York, uh, we would go for walks. We continued the same tradition in Nicaragua and Ecuador, just going for walks. Was it for exercise? Well, you can see that we need that, right? So we'd go for walks, and uh, we'd go just to meet people as well. So I had a dog back then, a little uh, mix of a black lab, and she would walk with us, and I would I'd like to train them to do different things. And, and so she would walk with me, and I'd have her sit when a car would pass so she wouldn't run, because I would walk off leash eventually. And I wanted her to sit when a car would pass so she wouldn't run out in front of the car and get hit. And eventually she learned that I wouldn't even have to give the command when a car would come, she would sit, and the car would pass, and then I would give the command, and she could run in the fields and in the woods and up and down on the street and stuff. And we would work on different things as we walked. And uh, one time I met a new person, and they said, oh, are you the one that has the dog that sits down? And it's just one of those common things that, that it's a connector, right? You have to live on mission, looking for those opportunities all the time, so that whatever you're doing, as, simply, as simple as a walk in Ecuador, uh, we were running, uh, myself and the six girls. So we were quite an attraction, right? A bald bearded guy with six young girls w running up a, a, path, a, a river path and up one side and down the other and for exercise. And so we, were, we obviously stuck out as the gringo family with all the redheads and blondes and beard and guy and, and uh, people recognize us as this group. And that open conversation, oh yeah, are you, you're the people that run up and down the river, right? And it's, it's those openings to conversations. Just whatever you're doing, and whatever you're doing, live on mission in the gospel. Paul was tent making. And so he found someone else that made tents, and that connected them. What do you do? Oh, I do the same thing. Hey, we should work together. Let's, let's talk. Let's figure things out. I know someone that often 
uh, when they meet someone, the first, they try to jump right to the gospel. They jump right to the gospel. And I, I've seen this before when they do that, and the, per, the person, they say, hey, how are you, whatever, and then they say, oh, I'm a Christian, do you know Christ? And then you see this glazed look come over the person, and they're done in the conversation. Now, I'm not saying we should never share the gospel on a first encounter with someone, but we want to live on, live on mission in the gospel so that we can connect, that we can have an open door, that we can eventually share the gospel with them so that there's an ongoing dialogue in the, with the gospel. We had friends years ago that are to this day still atheists, and uh, as we got to know them, <clears throat> uh, eventually we had, a, had Bible studies with them. And after the second Bible study, the lady said to us, uh, you know what, we're probably not going to keep doing, or before the, Bible, the second Bible study, she said, we don't, we're probably not going to keep doing this, but we'll do this last one. So we finished the Bible study, and she said, yeah, you know what, we don't want to keep doing it. You're not going to change our minds on this. But then she said, can we still be friends? And that door has remained open. A little bit more to that story just real quick is that so they never came to Christ. They never came to the church, of course. But her dad came to Christ later in life and as a member of our church in western New York. You never know what God is doing when we live on mission in the gospel. So literally, as you're going, whatever you are doing, in other words, the goal is to make disciples. If you're in school, if you're working, if you're shopping, if you're on vacation, if you're making tents, if you're running up and down the river path, whatever we're doing, live on mission in the gospel. In verse number five, is, uh, Aquila and Priscilla saw that Paul was occupied with preaching the word. He was occupied with the word. He was occupied with testifying and preaching. They saw what he was all about. They saw what consumed his life. As he was making tents to sustain what he could do with the gospel. And whatever he was doing, he was allowing them to observe that. You've heard me say already that family is, is important, and we want our girls to observe and participate in what we're doing. So one time we showed up at a church to, to present missions, and uh, a lady came up to one of the girls and said, oh, are your parents the missionaries this morning? And she res our daughter responded back to her, well, I'm a missionary too. And the lady kind of took a step back, and well, of course, yeah, we recognize that. And that's what we want our children to, to understand, that it's not my ministry as we go to Ecuador. It's not Irena and mine. It's us as a family. So our first team is not me and the other guys that we work with. Our fir my first team is our family. That in, as much as we can do, we serve together. I want them to know that they are a vital part of missions and ministry. So they are observing everything that we do. Do you want to know one of the qualifications for a pastor? is that his family is in order. And, and I would transfer that to missionary as well, or really any believer. But we have those as particular qualifications for a pastor or elder. And many times that's one of the conflicts that we have with, with a pastor that, what about his family? Did you know what his son or his daughter did? Or whatever it might be. And I want our children to know that they are a vital part of the ministry and missions. Our family is our missions team. We live on mission in the gospel together. Well, eventually here, uh, they would see the people in this context here reject the truth in verse number six, and our daughters have seen some of those very similar things, uh, very difficult things within the, the church context or even within the, mi the missionary world. But these are learning or teaching opportunities that we have to, to see how we respond or react as, as their parents, as the missionaries, as a pastor, these are teaching opportunities. So here's what happens with, uh, with Paul and Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, they walked with Paul as he, as he left teaching in the synagogue and continued in the ministry of, of another member of that believing community. So here's the point. Aquila and Priscilla were with Paul. They observed, they learned, they were working alongside him for at least six months. He was in this area for a year and a half. And they had come to know Christ at a certain point in time. And Paul was teaching life and, and ministry is one and the same. Have you ever heard someone use those kinds of... Now, I don't mean to split hairs here, but we've heard... Maybe you've heard people say, uh, 
something about ministry, to enter the ministry, to do ministry. Uh, I read a book recently where the author said when he became a pastor, he left the ministry. Why would he say that? What does that mean? Well, if you were to look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 12, it says that God gave apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So who's supposed to do ministry? The saints. It says for the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. So those who are serving in, in the role of elder is not to do ministry, but to equip the saints for ministry. So we, we have this, uh, this white-collar, blue-collar idea of ministry that we hire a pastor and it's his job to visit the sick in the hospital. It's his job to do this, that, and the other thing in ministry. We have friends that would say this, oh, we love ministry. We just love to do ministry. And I would push back and say, well, who's supposed to do ministry? Not just me. It's, I'm not hired to complete a job. Certainly there are things that are expected, right? It's a little, it's a little gray now of, of what those things look like. But we are all together in this. We have this white-collar idea that we've hired a pastor to, to be the professional and to do ministry. But the truth is that we are all part of the body and all a part of, uh, of fulfilling ministry together. You know, when we do things like this and we, we split up life and ministry, we, we secularize some things and we spiritualize other things. So we say things like the, the pulpit is sacred. The church building is sacred. Uh, we had an issue recently where someone was complaining about bringing drinks into the sanctuary. I put those in quotes because I don't use the word sanctuary. I say auditorium because this is not the Holy of Holies. God does not dwell here in this temple alone. God dwells in me and in you. The sanctuary is, is me. That's the temple. And so this idea, was, we, now I'm not saying that we shouldn't take care of the carpet and the chairs and this and that, right? But we need to put things in perspective that this is not the holy place. That in reality, all is holy. So that when we leave here, our car is also holy. When we go to work or school, those places are also holy. So that we live differently, we live as, as though all is sacred, all is holy. If we have that perspective, it changes the way we handle things, right? This is living on mission in the gospel. The gospel changes us to have a different, a different perspective. So that it's not the pastor who does these things, it's not the church that is holy, that we're in this together. Living on mission in the gospel means that all is sacred. All is sacred. We need to live on mission in the gospel. It's not separating church on Sunday with the rest of the week. Those are things that we've heard before, concepts that we understand, and then we kind of put those on the back burner, and we, now we're at work or we're at school, and, and this is just normal life. All is sacred. That's what it means to live on mission in the gospel. It's every member participating in ministry. You know, these are based on Old Testament principles, I believe. Uh, if you were to go back to the book of Deuteronomy, we're not going to, you don't need to turn there, but uh, it's interesting to, look, to read the book of Deuteronomy and look for things that are repeated, things that are highlighted throughout the book of Deuteronomy. In chapter 4, uh, it says, only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, unless they depart from your heart all the days of your life. Make them known to your children and your children's children. This is a theme that's, that's given throughout the book of Deuteronomy. You see this, this phrase, your children and your children's children, you, the next generation and the following generation. That faith and life and faith was not meant to just stop with me. It was to be multi-generational. So that when we come to a gathering like this, that we don't see just one generation across the board. And in many churches across the United States or even around the world, that we have a generation of believers that is an older generation. And we have to ask, what happened to the younger generation? My parents were first generation Christians. What does that mean? It means that their parents did not know Christ. Their parents were not, were not in the Christian world whatsoever. And by God's grace, both my parents came to Christ 
met, got married, had a family uh, that produced three children. I have two sisters that all know Christ. Were my parents perfect? Not by any means. Are we perfect? No. But they taught us one thing, that faith does not stop with the parents, that they, the parents have a responsibility to pass to the next generation, to demonstrate what it means to live on mission in the gospel, to live on mission in the gospel. And it doesn't stop with me, right? Sometimes uh, that first generation has a first generation experience in faith. If you want to go back to, to the book of Joshua and Judges, you, you see an example of this, that uh, the Israelites they remember leaving Egypt. You see the next generation crossing the Jordan, going into the promised land. They saw the walls of Jericho come down. The next generation heard the stories. The third generation, it says in the book of Judges, did not know the Lord. How quickly we forget the Lord. Why didn't they know the Lord? Because their parents didn't tell them. And they didn't tell them because they didn't have that firsthand experience. Their parents did, the grandparents. So you may think, well, you're talking about if you have kids, that it's your responsibility to uh, pass faith to your children. I'm not talking about because you're a Christian, your children will be a Christian. We understand that God saves each person individually, right? It's by his grace. So don't, don't uh, misunderstand that, please. But I'm talking about the responsibility of passing those, that faith to the next generation. But it doesn't, it's not just about parent and child. It talks about generation to generation to generation, which means grandparents also have a responsibility to the grandchildren. It's living on mission in the gospel. Every day, not just on Sunday, not just when we're in a, in a church context. It's every day, whatever we're doing, tent making, running up and down the river paths, going to school, going to work, that everything is holy. Everything is sacred. That church is not just for the people on the platform. It's not just for the professionals. Church is not an event, but everyone's serving. Church is not a place, but a people. Church is not for programs, but for preparing to serve. Church is not a club, but a community. And church is not a location to hear a message, but a launching pad for missionaries. And I'm not just talking about us going to Ecuador. I'm talking about all of us launching out into this world. We were at a church just a week or two ago where they said uh, they ended the service with everything. And instead of saying, you are dismissed, they said, you are sent. It's the first time I'd ever heard that in a church service. I thought, that is, that is great. That is fantastic. To remind us, sometimes you see the plaques over the door, you're now entering the mission field, right? But this was verbal from the pulpit. They ended in prayer and said, you are sent, commissioned each and every week as missionaries into our lost world. So what happens when we recognize that all is sacred? When we recognize that all is sacred, we begin to live on mission in the gospel. So the first characteristic of people who are mobilized by the gospel is that they live on mission in the gospel. That's what Paul did. He lived on mission in the gospel, whether he was making tents or meeting someone new or, or preaching in the synagogue, he lived on mission in the gospel. The second thing that we see is someone who is mobilized by the gospel lives in, in the tension that the gospel produces. They live in the tension that the gospel produces. Stay in Ch Acts chapter 18. Look at verses 18 through 22. Verse 18 through 22. After this, Paul stayed many days longer and then took leave of the brothers and set sail for Syria and with him Priscilla and Aquila. So he took them with him, right? And at a place that's hard to pronounce, if you're reading along with me, he had cut his hair for he was under a vow. And they came to Ephesus and he left them there. Did you grasp that? He grasp, did you grasp that? He set sail with Priscilla and, Priscilla and Aquila, and they came to Ephesus, and he says, and he left them there. But he himself went into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews, and when, uh, when they asked him to stay for a longer period, he declined. But on taking leave of them, he said, I will return to you if God wills, and he set sail from Ephesus 
when he landed at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church and then down, went down to Antioch. Uh, let me finish with verse 23. And after spending some time there, he departed and went from one place to the next through the region of Galatia and, and Ferg, uh, Ferga, strengthening all the disciples. So, one who is mobilized by the gospel lives on mission in the gospel. They also live in tension that the gospel produces. So Paul decides to leave Corinth and he takes Priscilla and Aquila with them. And I love this, that uh, as they're going with them, he arrives there with these new believers. They were believers for maybe a year and a half or so. They had fled Italy because of persecution and arrived in Corinth and met Paul and they were making tents together. And they're, try, they're there trying to get acclimated to a new country, perhaps even a new language or a dialect or something, a new culture at least. We know what that's like. So they're still new believers, and Paul says, come on, you're going with me. So they left their home, arrived in a new country, and Paul says, come on, you're going with me, we're going somewhere else. Paul has a history of taking people with him. You track that as you read about Paul's life, right? Barnabas, Silas, Luke, John, Mark, Epaphroditus, Titus, Timothy, just to name a few. Because it's a characteristic for Paul to live on mission in the gospel. So he says, come on with me. Let's do this. I think he had an example somewhere, right? Do you remember someone else that, that, come, that came and said, follow me? So he lived on mission in the gospel. It's living life on life with others or shoulder to shoulder with someone else. But look at this in verse uh, 19. It says that he left them there. And then verse 21, that he set sail for Ephesus. He left them there. So he says, come on with me. All right, you're going to stay here. I'm leaving. Can you imagine? What if I came to you and, uh, you know, you put your name in, 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 in the situation here. And, and I said, as Dan Doyle, missionary to Ecuador, come on, you're coming with me to Ecuador. We're leaving next week. And you agreed, okay. Man, I believe God's opened this door. I'm going. So we get to Ecuador. We start getting involved with some things, whatever. It is, and, I, and I observe you doing some things. And I say, all right, you're staying here. I've got to go to a different city. Can you imagine? I mean, people say to us all the time, uh, you take your girls to Nicaragua or Ecuador? They live with you? They live in Ecuador? Do they know Spanish? What's that like for them? Isn't that dangerous? Several years ago, when we came back from Nicaragua the first time, I think 2016, there had just been some, I don't remember exactly now, some shootings, I think in Connecticut, some a school shooting, there were some bombs or something, I can't remember exactly. Uh, and people in Nicaragua were concerned for us to come back to the States because of how dangerous it seemed. Right, can we wrap our minds around that? What's, what's unknown is, is scary, right? So he leaves them, he leaves Aquila and Priscilla, and he sets sail for Ephes from Ephesus, and he eventually arrives in Antioch. He's living on mission in the gospel. So living on mission in the gospel brings us to live in the tension that the gospel produces, we as North Americans, or maybe just as human beings, resist any kind of tension. Whenever it's uncomfortable, whatever presents something different or, or danger or whatever it might be, we resist that. We've lived a whole, this whole last year with a fear of what possibilities could happen. And there was a, there was a real threat of danger, right? But we avoid, avoid the fear and the danger at all costs. We're not willing to face that danger. We want to seek comfort and stability as much as possible. And Paul just dove into that and said, come on, you're coming with me. All right, I'm leaving you here and I'm moving on. Can you put yourself in those shoes? Many people have said to us, you're taking your kids? I could never do that. I couldn't leave my kids, couldn't leave my grandkids, couldn't leave my, my friends, couldn't leave my, my home, my church, my job. And we, we would hear these things as we were going and sharing with churches, and I would think, why are there so many disobedient believers? Why do people resist the call that God has given to go into all the world and make disciples? 
Now, I, I understand not every single one of us in here is going to go to Ecuador or pick a country. But we're all called to live on mission in the gospel. We're called to confront that tension in the gospel and live in that, embrace it, and see what God will do in that tension. Because the gospel is never meant to stay in one place. What if, what if the first believers uh, in, in, the, in, in Acts chapter 2 just said, well, we're just going to stay here in Jerusalem? That's been tried before. Not with a church, but, but with proclaiming who God is. Are you tracking with me what, what I'm talking about? What was the very first command given to mankind? To Adam and Eve. Do you remember? He's, God says, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Right? We've been accused of trying to accomplish that in and of ourselves. But he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so Adam and Eve, that was their mission. Be fruitful, multiply. It was not just about having more children and filling the earth with people, but about spreading out and, and, and going throughout the land. I believe originally, if we had stayed in the garden, it would just have expanded the garden and proclaiming the greatness of God from generation to generation. But sin entered, of course, but, and still the, the command was given to, to be completed, to go out and, and multiply, be fruitful, multiply, and fill the earth and proclaim God's name from generation to generation. Of course, you know the story, sin grew and overcame uh, the population in that time. So Noah and the flood happened. And as they came off the ark, that same command was repeated. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And what did they do just a couple chapters later? They said, let us build a tower to the heavens so that we will not be dispersed and scattered. We can all stay in one place. So God comes and confuses their language and scatters them. And now we have to study and learn Spanish. <laughs> so God scattered his people. You can see examples of this over and over and over again in Scripture. The idea was to be launched throughout the world. So when, when Jesus is ascending into heaven and he gives the Great Commission, this was not a new concept. It's based on the book of Genesis. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Go into all the world and reproduce. And so Paul says to Priscilla and Aquila, you're coming with me. All right, now you're staying here. I'm leaving. And it's going to be hard. In this world, you will have trouble. This is living in the tension that the gospel produces. When you come to the book of Acts chapter 8, this is after the stoning of Stephen, and it says that, that the church was scattered because of the persecution. And Paul, or Saul then, was the reason for that. And they were scattered throughout the entire region. This is how God was moving his church and scattering them around, around the world. I read this statement from C.T. Studd some years ago. He says, some want to live within the sound of, of a church bell. I want to run a rescue mission within a yard of hell. It's all about what our purpose is. Is our purpose to remain in where it's comfortable? To continue doing what we're doing? To avoid danger? To avoid the tension? Or to live in the tension that the gospel produces? I remember praying through some of these decisions about ministry direction and where to go what to do, how to accomplish this, and praying through this with Irena. Um, and realizing that it's not comfortable to try to communicate in a second language. I, now I, I preach and I teach in Spanish when we're in Ecuador or Nicaragua or Costa Rica. And I have people sitting here just like you, and I come to a word that I cannot pronounce or I cannot get the right conjugation. I'm like, I'm struggling with this. And I tell people, just tell me, just help me with this. And so they speak back to me and they help me get that next word out. Or I will finish a sermon and someone will come up and, I, and it sounds like they're going to say, hey, that was a blessing. Thanks for encouraging. This challenged me. And they don't say that. They said, you kept on saying this word wrong. <laughs> yes. Or my daughters do the same thing. You said that wrong every time you said it. It's not comfortable to try to share the gospel or to get to a heart issue 
in a second language. It's difficult. When we are in Ecuador, we are the foreigners. We are the awkward ones. We are the ones who don't understand the jokes. We're the ones that they will ask us the same question three times and we just give up and nod and smile and then they understand we have no idea what they just said. <laughs> but why do we do that? Our family has chosen to live in the tension that the gospel produces. God tells us about the foolish and the weak. He's not looking for the perfect, for the most qualified but those who will simply respond to the call. And he gives us this principle that when I am weak, then we recognize his strength in that. You know, here I'm kind of an average, average height, average weight. Just, I'm just a normal American. When we're in, in Latin America, I'm like a football player, right? I'm bigger than everyone, taller than everyone. Uh, my Spanish will never be like a Latino. I can never understand all of their jokes. And it's exactly where God wants me. To understand my weakness, to understand my limitations, to understand how difficult it is. Why am I sharing all of this? Because perhaps you're sitting there thinking, I could never be a pastor, I could never be a missionary, I could never be a Sunday school teacher, I could never stand up here and play an instrument in front of someone, I could never lead the kids' ministry, I could never do this or that. Great. It's exactly where God wants you. Recognize that we are weak and that he will make known his strength in us. Living in the tension that the gospel produces brings us to live a life that leads to gospel mobilization. It leads us to gospel mobilization. I just want to point you to, if you can turn over real quick to 1 Corinthians chapter 16, we see how Paul comes to know Priscilla and Aquila. He calls them to go with them. He leaves them in Ephesus, and, and, and he goes on to Antioch. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 19. Look what it says here. As he's finishing the book of 1 Corinthians, he says, The churches of, of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla, together with a church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. They become church planters. There's a church in their home. Uh, in, in Romans chapter 16, verse 3, he, he calls them co-workers in Christ Jesus. There's many more things that we could look at about Priscilla and Aquila. But they answered the call. They, they first observed Paul living on mission in the gospel. They went with him when he said, come on, let's go. They stayed when he said, I'm leaving you here. They decided to confront the difficulty and the uncomfortableness and continued in what they've been called to do. We have been privileged to walk with several different people or couples. I showed a picture and told some stories in Sunday school about Alex and Lorena, who are from Nicaragua. We've known them since they were teenagers. They're married and have a little baby boy now. Baby boy, he's over a year old now, a year and a half or so now, I guess. Uh, and have seen them grow up in the Lord, have seen them answer the call for missions, the first missionary sent from Nicaragua, and watching them return back to their home country, leading a church plant. He's, he sent me some pictures uh, last week of the church plant that they've run out of chairs. There's no more room, nowhere to sit. There's people standing around the perimeter of, of their location. And God is continuing to do a great work with people. But what would have happened? Well, I believe God will accomplish his work with me or without me. But he allowed us to go to Nicaragua to make those kinds of connections, the Priscilla and Aquila type of, of a connection, and watch what God does through them that we can share their story with you now of what God is doing with Alex and Lorena. As we have conversations, not just about church planting and strategy, but about marriage, about dealing with a one-year-old little boy. How does this work? What does this mean? What do we do with this? 
It's life on life. Living on mission in the gospel, living in the tension that the gospel produces, and then that leads to gospel mobilization. Can I encourage you? If you're wondering, where do I, where do I fit in? What's my part? That God has a place for you as part of the body of Christ. I'm not saying right now, tomorrow, you're going to go with us on to Ecuador. But you live here. So God has p- placed you here. He's called you here. So begin serving here. And perhaps one day, a, a Paul will come and say, hey, we need you in China or Africa or Ecuador. And you'll be ready to say, that's me. I'm ready to live in the tension that the gospel produces. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the example that we have with different characters, people in the, in the early church of responding to your call, that they lived a life transformed and mobilized by the gospel. Lord, I pray that there would be people here to respond in the same way, to be not just transformed and recognize their position, position before you, but to realize their purpose that you've called them to. That you would do a work here in Rhode Island to continue to grow your church here locally, but to be expanded regionally and internationally. That there would be people to serve locally and be sent out internationally for all the purpose to give you glory, to make your name great among the nations, to proclaim you throughout the world. Lord, we thank you for your word and what it's called us to, that you've given us everything we need for life and godliness, that we can recognize your strength when we are weak. Lord, we commit these things to you, and we pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen.